Hello everyone, this is Evan Abrams for Adobe Video and Motion. I'm here to have a look at how you can make use of media replacement in motion graphics templates. I recently had the opportunity to bring some templates to make some for some big names on YouTube. So I hope you enjoy this little look into the process of what we created for them. We were trying to bring some more production value to their channels while saving them some production time. This piece was made for Demi Bagby, a CrossFit athlete and fitness influencer who was much more on TikTok and Instagram, but is making the move into YouTube with much more long form pieces. She and her team wanted to get across the vibe of each video and welcome new audiences to her brand. Each week, she's taking on a new challenge, a new sport, maybe going head to head against a guest. So it was important that we give a bit of a preview to the who, what and where with footage elements while keeping things dynamic and poppy off the start. One of the challenges when working with a template that will have footage is getting swapped out, especially footage that we're going to be treating with effects and colorization, is that we need to give the flexibility in case incoming footage is brighter, darker, more contrasted, less contrasted. We just can't know everything about what footage might get swapped in. So a lot of this template's function is around treating that footage with what are essentially gels or filters. So here in After Effects, how do we create that kind of filtered look? Well, I've done it with a couple of layers, one of them set to add and the other one set to color. And I've dropped that over every swappable footage element. Here's a nice isolated example in here where we've got the two layers alone with their footage. And as you can see, set to add, set to color and their opacity changes the intensity of this effect. So if this is say different footage and you need maybe more of the additive, less of it, depending on whether we're inside or at the beach or where this might be, we can manually dial that in. And when giving this control later, say up here in the essential graphics, when we drag any property up into this space, those become easy controls, easy things that we can change up here. These filters are created using a couple of very simple, very minimal effects. It's a gradient ramp and a tritone. So the gradient ramp just puts a ramp from dark to light. And then we use the tritone to remap those values. That allows us to have maybe a little bit of a polarized look like it's cool sunglasses perhaps. The tritone of both of these layers are linked together using a simple pick whip from one property to the other. That means that we would only have to alter or give controls to one of the effects in order for both of them to change. And I've made sure to put those on solids that are large enough that they can rotate around freely without clipping at the edges. This little bit of rotation can just add some variety to perhaps static or slow motion shots and can just make it feel a little bit more alive. So this core idea gets repeated throughout the template, but let's have a look at the structure of the template itself. So running through here, we start on one big shot, then we go into a lockup with two, and then we've got kind of a large image and then a pop-up and then another pop, and then it blooms out just the way it came in. So we're starting on brightness, we're ending on brightness, trying to keep this energy and enthusiasm throughout the whole piece. Now here, when building the template, I've just used still images to stand in for our footage. Those can be swapped out for footage later, but this keeps working on the template nice and light. Now, the reasoning behind why we've structured it this way is we want to leverage the kind of cinematography that Demi's team is already putting out. Bold, dynamic, expressive shots really play well when we just kind of leave them alone. So that's why we've gone with one big, bold opening. Then we kind of interrupt the viewer with some text coming in. The text here uses a lot of hold keyframes, which really grab the attention when they start to scale in like this. And then we go into this lockup of two because a lot of Demi's content is Demi doing something or Demi versus someone, or there's some kind of an interplay there. So we wanted to be able to put kind of hero footage on one side and then contextual footage on the other. Being able to tint them differently can really highlight kind of the difference between the two things. It makes a simpler visual language for the audience. This title can also be completely customized. You can change the font size. You can change the text itself. We might have two lines. We might have three lines. And if that's the case, I thought it was essential to allow for the size of that to change as well. You can give those additional controls by going to the edit properties here and just enabling all of those user customizations later on. Another little feature that can be adjusted is the size of this rectangle. And I've used a couple of expressions to make sure that the titles always end at like a quarter in from either side. So the titles themselves, as you can see this one is stuck on a null here. And that null has a fairly interesting expression on here that makes sure that it always ends 
comes up at this place right here. So I've got a slider control and I've got variables for where I want its movement to start, where I want its movement to end, and its movement will always end at the size of this rectangle divided by four. This allows me to externalize the control over this thing, blending relative and absolute values. This is the same kind of setup that I've used to make sure that we can kind of bloom into the template. So if I'll just dial into the expression here, we can see we're using a slider control on here and the linear expression to basically remap this slider control that changes from zero to 100 down to whatever the effect has been dialed in as. This allows us to have both manual controls and still have specific animation. See, I've animated the slider, so the slider will go from full on down to whatever's been dialed in, just like this null here will always go from the center to a quarter of this rectangle, no matter what size that rectangle is. If this is your first time looking at expressions, I highly recommend you get into them. They can definitely be confusing, so I'd recommend checking out the Adobe Help Guide to get even deeper into expressions if that's something you'd like to work into your workflows. And if you're making templates, they can be really helpful. Now, let's talk a bit about the motion that you see going on. We talked a bit about the hold keyframes that bring stuff in, but we're also using a lot of really extreme easing. So in this part, we see a lot of scaling of the footage and another scale and another scale. It kind of feels like maybe a heartbeat or there's something very explosive about it. And we're able to modify that stuff just with some scale keyframes. But a lot of the nuance of their motion comes down to manipulating the graph editor, which you can access here. And as you can see, these nice little kind of heartbeat shapes here. Do -do 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 going through. This is caused by manipulating the Bezier handles. So right now we are looking at a speed graph. So if I go in here and I alter that speed over time by dragging the handles around, as you can see, now this is a little bit different as compared to this, as compared to this. And the default when you ease something, so if you easy ease any keyframes, either by going animation, keyframe assistant, easy ease, or select them and hitting F9, the default looks like this, which is kind of meh. We don't want things to be meh. We want things to be energetic, poppy. So that's why I pulled all the keyframes to have this really extreme version here. You can also work with a value graph if that makes more sense, as you can see the value changing over time, whereas the more vertical line shows us a more extreme change in value. Getting to know the graph editor, getting comfortable with it is where you can do a lot of nuanced motion work. I find it can bring a lot of nuance to something like this, especially when we're creating a brand that has specific colors, it has specific shapes, it should have specific motion as well. And this is how you can dial that in. Now, once you've got everything dialed in the way you want it, everything's moving well, everything's looking good, we have to bring controls up to the essential graphics window. So you can open that up by going window, essential graphics, and we start to simply drag controls in. So any property that you have here, such as the opacities here, we can just drag that up here. But as you can see, we have many, many controls in here and I've organized them using formatting. So for example, we can add a group, you can name the group, you can then stick things into the group. Using groups like this is very helpful, especially in a montage when we have, in this case, six individual footage elements, each having their own unique tints that we want to apply to them. So being able to put these in groups is very helpful for an editor. These will present as twirl down groups in Premiere and in the essential properties inside of After Effects. At a glance, an editor knows exactly what they want to change. Also, I advise that you make your controls in what Adam Savage would call first order retrievability. When working from the top to the bottom, the most common elements that are going to be changed should be the first ones on the list. So in my mind, that's the footage. The footage is always going to be changed. And then the amount of the additive and color tints, those amounts are maybe going to be changed. And then the actual colors themselves are probably seldom going to be changed. If you're going to give a heap of controls to later users, this kind of thinking about their experience will make a huge difference, especially when you're designing designing for someone who needs to make fast choices. But I think that brings our time to a close. I hope this is helpful for you when you're thinking about bringing media replacement into your projects. We have more videos in this series coming up, so you want to stick around for more of those. Make sure you turn on notifications so you don't miss a single update, tip, trick, or tutorial right from the source. I'm Evan Abrams. Thanks again for watching and have a great day.